On today's show, the Aqua Kids go to work for Noah. So, ready to make a difference? Building a better planet starts with you. at home and welcome to another awesome episode of Aqua Kids. I'm Katie and I'm Drew. On today's episode of Aqua Kids we're headed to sunny Beaufort, North Carolina to work in the NOAA lab. Today we're here at the NOAA lab. NOAA? Who's NOAA? <laughs> Not who, it's what? Oh. It's the national... Uh... It's okay, we'll just go ask James and see what he says. Good plan. <laughs> Hi James. Hi. Hi guys, welcome to NOAA. Thank, Thank you. you. So what exactly is NOAA and what do they do? The NOAA stands for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Oh, it's not a person. <laughs> Definitely gotcha. not. <laughs> so it's part of our, of our government. It's actually mm -hmm. part of the Department of Commerce. Here we're at the NOAA Beaufort Laboratory, which is the second oldest federal fisheries laboratory in the country. Wow. We've been doing research here at this laboratory for over a hundred years. Well, I haven't been doing <laughs> research here. You don't look a hundred. I'm not a hundred. <laughs> but what exactly goes on behind these doors? So here at the NOAA Burford Lab, we actually have two different parts of NOAA. We have the National Marine Fisheries Service. We also have the National Ocean Service. I work in the National Ocean Service. And in the National Ocean Service, we work on coastal stewardship. Okay. We, work, we work to develop coastal planning tools for coastal managers to help them decide about coastal resources. We also work on things like climate change. Ooh. Well, can we go inside and take a look? Absolutely, let's get a look. Okay. So let's make sure we get into some of the research laboratories and look awesome. at some of the science underway today. Yeah, that'll be awesome. So Dr. James, I know that lionfish have been in the news a lot recently because of how invasive they are. And Noah has done a lot of research trying to figure out what we can do to stop them. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Absolutely. Let's take a look at some lionfish we have here in the lab. Okay. Oh, wow. They're big. So this is an invasive lionfish. Mm -hmm. um, we've been studying lionfish for about a decade here at the Noah wow. Burford Laboratory. We've been working on studies to document their biology and ecology and overall impacts on reef fish communities along the southeast, Caribbean, and Gulf of Mexico. And what have you found? Well, we found that uh, we're pretty concerned about lionfish. We Absolutely. found that they can have major impacts to biodiversity of reef fish communities and even coral reefs. Wow. And, and why is that? What do they do that causes that change in biodiversity? Well, that, that's a complicated question, mm -hmm. but there's a few things that we've learned. One is that lionfish, we know, are consuming a large number of prey fishes. Okay. Uh, fishes that are important economically and ecologically to reef systems. Wow. So we know that they are consuming species like Vermilion Snapper or Nassau Grouper, some of these important e economically important species. Mm -hmm. What we're concerned about overall is when you have a new predator, a new top predator in the reef system, how is that new predator going to change the diversity and the balance of that right. reef fish community? And it goes all the way down the food chain. I'm Assuming. There are. There, and there are big concerns about the interactions of lionfish as an invasive species with other reef stressors mm -hmm. like climate change and pollution oh, wow. and even fishing. Wow. And so where have you found these fish lately? So lionfish were first introduced, we believe, off the coast of South Florida back okay. in the mid-80s. Mm -hmm. uh, many folks have, have thought that the introduction was because of Hurricane Andrew that oh. occurred in South Florida, but that's not the case. Okay. Um, we have documentation of lionfish being collected back to 1985. No way. It wasn't until 2000 that we began seeing large numbers of lionfish off the coast of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And then the invasion spreads further south um, into the Caribbean and more recently in the Gulf of Mexico. So what can be done to stop the, their invasion? Well, one of the challenges is just how broad their geographic range is now. Absolutely. We're talking a fish that um, originated from the Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean mm -hmm. that is now in the Atlantic. Wow. We have lionfish documented now from North Carolina all the way to South America. And we expect them to, uh, to uh, stop their distribution when they reach the coast of Argentina. 
No way. So one of the challenges is what do you do about a fish that is in the ocean, that is so far and has such a wide geography? It's really like a worldwide problem. It, it is a regional problem for this, for this part of our planet. Mm -hmm. So what we're, going, what we're working on is developing local control strategies for lionfish. Okay. We know we can't eradicate them in the entire ocean, mm -hmm. but we can make a difference locally, whether it be in a marine protected area, an artificial reef, or just an area of conservation that, that a reef manager, a coastal manager, needs to, uh, is working to develop a control plan. Is there anything a, a normal citizen can do to try and stop these fish? Absolutely. Very good question. There are local derbies happening all over the southeast, hmm. Caribbean, and even in the Gulf of Mexico, where divers and enthusiasts are going out, working in a coordinated way to remove lionfish. It is great to know that people like you and I can help curtail the invasive lionfish problem. Yeah. I have to start preparing for the next lionfish derby. <laughs> oh, jeez. Don't go away. When Aqua Kids returns, we'll be learning all about aquaculture. Aqua Kids presents another Aqua Kids pop quiz. Do you know how long aquaculture has been practiced in the world? Is it A, 150 years, B, 1,000 years, or C, 2,500 years? Don't swim off. We'll have the answer after the break. We're back with the answer to today's pop quiz. So, if you guess C, 2,500 years, you would be correct. Aquaculture may just trace its roots to the ancient water-oriented civilizations of the East, where fish served as a main part of people's diets. During the Tang Dynasty, carp cultivation thrived in China. In the 5th century BC, Fan Li, an ancient Chinese advisor, was noted to have raised carp in ponds. Welcome back to AquaKids. We're headed back to the NOAA lab to learn about aquaculture. Much of the research done here at NOAA has to do with aquaculture. Drew, there's a lot of misinformation out there about aquaculture, but let's talk to Ken to learn the truth about aquaculture. Hi, Ken. Hey, guys. Hi. So we've heard a lot of negative things regarding aquaculture. Could you tell us a little bit of the facts about it? Absolutely. So aquaculture is the farming of aquatic organisms. Right. It includes fish and shellfish and even algae. It's a great way to add to our daily seafood supply. So some of the past practices with aquaculture that have had led to environmental concerns are pollution, issues with water quality, and even some issues related to fish health. But those, those issues are really far back long in the past. Today's aquaculture industry is environmentally sustainable, it's economically sustainable, the fish are healthy, they're a great source of protein for all Americans. So how much of the fish we eat today is aquaculture? So Americans eat an average of about 16 pounds of seafood each year. Wow. wow. And about half of the seafood we eat comes from aquaculture. How is your research helping to develop a sustainable aquaculture? So we're working with coastal managers industry and other agencies to develop environmentally sustainable aquaculture methods. This includes farming fish, using low protein feeds, using um, filtration systems to remove impurities for the water and actually recycle the water, wow. and, and developing spatial plans where we can site aquaculture and we can co-site it so that, so that it interacts um, with other industries and in a very favorable way so they can coexist in the environment. Sounds really efficient. Oh, absolutely. Now, some of these species have been farmed for a long time in aquaculture, but doesn't NOAA also take some species and try to see if there's a way that we can use other species for aquaculture? Absolutely. We have a whole suite of species that are, are kind of tried and true for the aquaculture industry. Those include like oysters and clams and a variety of shellfish species, but the finfish aquaculture industry is really exciting because this is really new to us. So doing marine finfish aquaculture, some of the new species we're working with are cobia, Florida pompano, red porgy, even flounder and, and some flatfish species. What do we have in here? So these are Florida pompano, oh. and they're, they're new to our lab, um, but in the U.S. there's about four to five aquaculture farms that are commercially producing pompano. Okay. The nice thing about pompano is the fact that they can be raised in fish tanks, they can be raised in ponds, as well as they can be raised in sustainable open ocean cage and net pen systems. That sounds really cool. Where does aquaculture happen? Marine aquaculture happens in every coastal state. We have shellfish like oysters and clams. We have marine fish. Um, it really can happen everywhere from coastal inland areas to estuaries to out in the open ocean. Wow. So can we take a look at the fish? Yeah, let's take a look at, our, look, look at our Florida pompano. 
So these fish are just an experiment to see how they do in aquaculture. Is that right? It is. It's a, it's a study. This is a study to see, um, look at the feeding and the growth rates of, of juvenile pompano and see really how long does it take for them to reach market size. And how big do they get? These fish, they can grow up to six or seven pounds. Wow. Oh, wow. oh I had no idea. But, I thought they were but just But market little. size from aquaculture is about a pound and a half to two pounds. Right. And from previous work with pompano, we know that it takes about a year to a year and a half to reach a pound and a half to two pounds. Okay. What makes pompano a good candidate species for aquaculture? Well, the first thing you have to have is public demand for it. People like to eat pompano. Secondly, it, um, it grows fast, being that it hit, reaches market size in a year to year and a half. Wow. Um, we have commercially prepared diets for pompano, as we do for other marine fish species. Mm -hmm. And then from the NOAA perspective, we're interested in knowing how pompano um, are compatible with our environment. We're studying their physiology, we're studying their metabolism, and looking to study how, how well they grow and perform and their waste products in the natural environment. And wow. how fast do they reproduce? So the, these fish will reproduce at about two years of age, and a single female will produce about 200,000 eggs. That's a lot. So they you will. don't have to worry about the number of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't. And the other thing is, is that in the United States, for pompano at least, there's a limited commercial fishery. Mm -hmm. And so um, the nice thing is, is that aquaculture pompano can go hand in hand with the commercial fishery that exists to help stabilize our markets. Wow. That's really important. I didn't know so many uh, important details have to go into aquaculture. It does. And we, we're also working on a variety of other species. Wow, I didn't know there are so many considerations that go into aquaculture. Aquaculture is just one form of a business. It also means that aquaculture is agriculture as well as a sustainable seafood uh, production method. And here at NOAA, we work on a variety of different species. Pompano is just one of the species that we're working on. Would you like to go take a look at other species? Yeah, let's sure, go look. Yeah. Yeah. I had a lot of negative perceptions about aquaculture before learning about all the benefits it provides. Yeah, Katie. Aquaculture is awesome because it's both economically and environmentally sustainable. Don't go away. AquaKids will be right back. AquaKids salutes aqua heroes, people working hard to keep the planet green and blue. Most of us will only see the Titanic in movies or in documentaries, but here's the man who found this legendary ship lying deep beneath the sea. Dr. Robert Ballard is founder and president of the Institute for Exploration at Mystic Aquarium in Mystic, Connecticut. He has also worked with the Jason Project, educating more than a million students each year. In 2013, his new ship EV Nautilus recently explored the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea. The goal was to map the geological, biological, archaeological, and chemical aspects of these areas. He is currently the explorer in residence for the National Geographic Society and the commissioner on U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy. Dr. Ballard has also discovered the German battleship Bismarck in the USS Yorktown. Who knows what he'll find next? Welcome back. If you thought the Florida pompano were cool, just wait until you see this next fish. Let's head back to the NOAA lab and learn some more about aquaculture. So Clark and Drew were just looking at the Florida pompano that are being used for aquaculture, and I know this is another species that's being used for aquaculture. Can you tell me about it? Absolutely. So this is a fish called the red porgy. Mm -hmm. It's similar to pompano in that it's a marine fish, it's, but it's different in that it's found on the offshore reefs uh, way out in the coastal ocean. Oh, wow. This fish is one of the species that we believe could be a good candidate for marine aquaculture. We're studying this species today, trying to understand a lot about its energetics, its metabolism, and so that we can use that information to do predictive modeling to look at environmental interactions. What are energetics? Well, energetics is basically quantifying the metabolism of the fish. So in order to do predictive modeling where we look at how many fish aquaculture um, operations we should site in the coastal ocean and what the size of the industry may be in certain, in, in certain coastal ocean zones or areas, we have to understand the species. We have to understand the conversion of feed to waste and if the system can in fact handle the amount of waste that may come out of that fish farm. Or in fact, it may not even be waste. It could be uh, assimilated and used for enhancing productivity. Oh, wow. So is aquaculture only really for growing fish to eat, or is it used for other things as well? Very good question. Aquaculture is really cultivation of marine life. Mm -hmm. it could, uh, in terms of marine aquaculture, we also, there is also freshwater aquaculture. Oh, okay. Uh, aquaculture involves cultivating ornamental species for your home aquaria. It also involves culturing things like algae for biofuels. Aquaculture is really cultivation of all types of marine life. 
And what are you doing with this particular species? Well, this, this particular species, we have been developing culture methods for about a decade. We've been learning how to spawn and rear them in the laboratory. We've been looking at uh, their energetics, how much they eat and their conversion ratios. We've been looking at their growth rates and that kind of thing for environmental modeling purposes. Interestingly, this species is a member of the Sparid family, okay. which is in a very important family in terms of aquaculture worldwide. This, is, this family of fishes represents the second most widely cultured fish on the planet, wow. second to salmon. And this is very new though, right? This is new. There, there are actually no aquaculture operations in the U.S. currently producing this species. Oh, but wow. we are working with industry partners to, de to deliver that technology to them. It is amazing to see what pioneering research Noah is conducting. I know. Soon we'll see red porgies popping up on our dinner plates. <laughs> That's right. Stay tuned. When Aqua Kids returns, we get to meet the very cool trigger fish. Apex predators, the guardians of our ecosystem, are vanishing. The gray wolf, ancestor to our modern dog, is found scattered throughout North America, Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. Once numbering in the millions, its population has fallen below 250,000 worldwide. An intelligent pack hunter, the wolf has a complex social structure and strong family bonds similar to humans. Ancient humans learned to hunt by watching wolves. These carnivores keep herbivore species healthy by preying only on the weak and injured, preventing overpopulation and overgrazing. Habitat loss, conflicts with humans over livestock, and our fears are the greatest threats to this misunderstood creature. Find out ways you can help the gray wolf and other apex predators on our website. Here's our top story, aquaculture expanding in Australia. On December 21st, 2013, a company named CO2 Group Limited bought Queensland Prawn Aquaculture Company for 9.9 .9 million US dollars. The acquisition of this company and its assets will allow for CO2 Group Limited to operate the oldest and largest fully integrated prawn aquaculture business in Australia. But CO2 Group Limited isn't planning on stopping there. In the next few years, they plan on a renovation that will make use of the most advanced production procedures available. Additionally, they plan to integrate another species, the black tiger prawn, into the crop. With the most updated technology and the introduction of a new species, CO2 Group Limited is sure to help the aquaculture industry meet the growing international demand for seafood. And they may help relieve the pressure on the natural prawn fisheries. It has been a win in the aquaculture world today, but there is still more to do. I'm Katie with Aqua News, keeping you connected to our planet. Now back to Aqua Kids. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. Let's go back to the NOAA lab to see what else we can learn from aquaculture research. Let's go. We're back here with Dr. James Morris from NOAA. Dr. Morris, how does aquaculture tie into research? So aquaculture is a cultivation of fish mm -hmm. or shellfish or any other marine life for a particular purpose like biofuel creation or food production. Mm -hmm. We have to use the same skills and techniques that we use for understanding aquaculture and doing aquaculture to do other types of marine ecology research. Okay. For example, to hold fish in the laboratory, you have to understand the water quality requirements, you have to understand the feeding requirements, Absolutely. and just the recirculating aquaculture, seawater systems technology to be able to do those things. Mm -hmm. So what kind of research are you doing with the trigger fish? So these are gray trigger fish, mm -hmm. and they are a marine reef fish that occur off the coast of North Carolina and along the southeast. This is a pilot study where we're, where we're learning how to hold them in the laboratory and develop some of the husbandry practices. Oh, this, wow. this study is actually a partnership with the National Marine Fisheries Service to better understand how to age fish for stock assessment purposes. And what is the importance of aging fish? Oh, aging is very important. Um, it's very important to understand the age structure of a population. I'll give an example. If you're over harvesting a, a population, the age structure will be skewed. It will be right. made up of certain age composition individuals that may not be healthy for the overall population. So what's really important is that you understand the accuracy and the, uh, how to determine specific ages of fish. What are some of the ways to determine the age of a fish? So today, the aging technology is, is really advanced. In the past, uh, aging scientists used to use mostly scales or other, some other bony parts. Today, the predominant structure to use in aging fishes is actually the ear bones called the otoliths. Otoliths are really unique features in the fish's body because they actually grow continuously. And because they grow continuously, 
they capture periods of fast and slow growth. And so there's translucent and opaque zones, sort of cloudy and clear zones in the otolith that can be counted and that correspond to, and most of the time, that correspond to uh, certain years of the fish's life. It looks like we're out of time for today's episode, but we sure did have a busy day. We sure did. It was fun to learn all about the groundbreaking research going on behind the doors of the NOAA Beaufort Lab. That's right, Katie. With all the research they're conducting on aquaculture, soon there will be many new species of fish showing up in our grocery stores. And you can't forget the work they are doing on invasive species. Hopefully we will be able to curtail the problem of invasive lionfish before it becomes too late. Of course. And you know it's scientists like Dr. James Morris and all of his fellow researchers at NOAA that help us to remember that everyone can do their part to help keep this planet green and blue. And so can you. So visit our website to follow us on our journey. And learn how you can come along with us. And together we can help keep the world and the water a great place to play and explore. And, and we'll, we'll see you next time on AquaKids.